to Badu's work that I'm going to start off with, and then I'm going to get into a discussion after that. Um, this is actually a presentation that I've already given um, at the Left Forum in New York a few weeks ago um, when I was on a panel with um, a representative of a Maoist organization, the Revolutionary Communist Party USA, as well as with the Badu translator and scholar uh, Bruno Bastilles from uh, Cornell University. And uh, we sort of discussed the relationship between um, Badu's work and um, current movements for communism in the world, such as in uh, South Asia, in India and Nepal, and also elsewhere, um, as well as uh, where Badu's work fits into the history of Marxism um, more generally. Um, but I'm going to open up the discussion then, uh, after I give the presentation, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the background for um, Badu in uh, Althusser and Lacan's work, and try to situate it that way. Um, so let me sort of get started here. Like I said, this, this uh, paper that I gave in New York that I'm going to give now, again, um, is a little bit of a polemic against Badu, um, but it raises the, the issues that I'd like to sort of situate him in. And then, as I said, after that, we'll get into uh, uh, more of a kind of uh, historical view of the background for Badu's work. So um, let me just say something also about the occasion of this. The occasion of this is the publication uh, last fall of a book, um, a translation of a book by Badu called The Communist Hypothesis. And it was published um, by Verso Books, um, which is affiliated with the New Left Review in Britain. And um, it's a, a small edition, sort of like uh, Mao's little red book. Um, it's a sort of red covered uh, hard, hardback book with a gold star in the middle. Um, and uh, prior to that, um, Badu had published in uh, English translation um, two sort of major works, um, Being an Event and The Logics of Worlds. And it's these three books that I'm mostly referring to when I'm talking about um, Badu's conception of communism now. Um, right before the publication of the, the Communist Hypothesis um, by Badu last fall, he had published an article in, new, in the New Left Review under the same title, and I'm going to be sort of citing that article. So those of you who came through the Facebook invite, there was a link to the, um, the article version of, of the book, The Communist Hypothesis. Um, okay. Perhaps the most condemnatory thing that could be said of Badu's communism was something Badu himself wrote when he defined communism as, quote, a Kantian regulatory idea. That is, a norm to be aspired to rather than a concrete reality to be achieved. This not only besmirched the historical Marxist idea of communism, but also Kant. For Kant addressed freedom as something that could and should be, not as a utopia. And Marx remained deeply engaged in practical politics. Leon Trotsky wrote, more than 100 years ago, after the 1905 Russian Revolution, that, quote, Marxism converted si socialism into a science, but this does not prevent some Marxists from converting Marxism into a utopia. Trotsky also wrote that, in academies, it might be possible artificially to detain the proletariat for 50, 100, or 500 years. This continues with Trotsky. But in the course of all-rounded life in capitalist society, on the basis of unceasing class struggle, the growth of the consciousness of the proletariat transforms this class struggle, gives it a deeper and more purposeful character. Close quote. Trotsky was not a utopian any more than Kant or Marx were. However, as we know, looking at history from the standpoint of 2011, such unceasing class struggle that Trotsky had in mind 100 years ago, which could transform the consciousness of the proletariat and potentially give it a deeper and more purposeful character, is precisely what the world has been missing for at least a generation. The Marxist vision for proletarian socialism has passed almost completely into oblivion. Badu, in his late re redefinition of communism, is responding and adapting to this historical reality. 
Indeed, Trotsky was writing at the crest of Second International Marxism, which was developed in the period from 1871 to 1917, whose history, Badu, deliberately seeks to bury. Badu characterizes this period, 1871 to 1917, like our own, as an interval in which the communist hypothesis was declared to be untenable, with the adversary in ascendant. What is the basis of Badu's judgment of this period, from 1871 to 1917, in which not only did bourgeois society go through its last great flowering in the Belle Epoque, but Marxism flourished as an international workers' movement, commanding a dedication to socialist revolution by millions in the core capitalist countries? The period between the Paris Commune and the October Revolution was not in any way like ours. It was not cynical, but rather optimistic in the sense of historical mission and the real potential of human progress. Badu shares the skepticism that has developed regarding such historical potential. Indeed, we can say that Badu is typical of the 1960s era New Left in this regard, of which he's a member of that generation. Badu cannot recognize that second international Marxism uh, of that period from 1871 to 1917 as an advance. Moreover, Badu is, in Trotsky's sense, academic, despite his avowed intentions. The last thing that Badu imagines is that he has conceded. Badu's entire philosophy was developed out of a concern for what he calls fidelity, resisting the apostasies of the 1968 generation that occurred in the decades that followed. The question is, to, to what does Badu claim fidelity? It is not Marxism. What has sanctioned Badu to bury the admittedly obscure history of the first wave of Marxism in the Second International today? And why does Badu find an affinity in our moment with that of the pre-World War I world, which otherwise seems so unlikely? In certain respects, Badu is rather optimistic in finding such an affinity, hoping that today we are in a period of preparation for the realization of more radical social transformation or revolution down the road. Badu thus tries to keep fidelity to the revolution in his estimation of the present. But which revolution? Badu is clear that his model for revolution is May 1968 in France and the contemporaneous great proletarian cultural revolution in China. Presumably in the latter case, this means a commitment to Mao and to Marxist-Leninism. But beneath this, there is a certain unmistakable pessimism to the characterization of the formative years of Lenin's Marxism in the Second International Era as being, like ours, one of conservative reaction. Was the growth of Marxism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries really a retreat after the defeat of the Paris Commune in 1871? Or has Badu mistaken one revolution for another? Badu has main maintained fidelity, I will argue, not to communism in Marx's sense, but rather to democracy. That is, to the eternal bourgeois revolution. This is something I'm going to talk about later. It is thus significant that Badu dates modern communism not to Marx in 1848, but rather to the Jacobins in 1792. This obscures the history that came between. The truth is that Badu's communism is deeply anti-Marxist not merely non-Marxist in the sense of what it tends to leave out, but actually hostile to historical Marxism. Perhaps this is unremarkable, perhaps it is not a problem in itself, but it may bear some inquiry into the potential consequences that might flow from this. Perhaps Badu is quietly acknowledging that Marxism may have come to an obstacle in, to the kind of, might have become, excuse me, an obstacle to the kind of social change that in his estimation is possible and desirable and necessary. That is a real question. Does Marxism speak to the needs of the present? But to consider this, to consider what Badu may have to offer as an alternative to Marxism, we must address what, what Badu means by communism. Badu defines communism as radical democratic equality. The hypothesis that motivates communism, according to Badu, is that, quote, the logic of class, the fundamental subordination of labor to a dominant class, the arrangement that has persisted since antiquity is not inevitable. It can be overcome. A different collective organization is practicable, one that will eliminate the inequality of wealth and even the division of labor. The existence of a coercive state separate from civil society will no longer appear a necessity. A long process of reorganization based on a free association of producers will see it withering away. Furthermore, Badu goes on, as an idea of pure equality, 
The communist hypothesis has no doubt existed since the beginnings of the state. As soon as mass action opposes state coercion in the name of egalitarian justice, rudiments or fragments of the communist hypothesis start to appear. Popular revolts, the slaves led by Spartacus, the peasants led by Munzer, might be identified as practical examples of this communist invariant. With the French Revolution, the communist hypothesis then inaugurates the epoch of political modernity. Close quote. However, the potential for emancipated humanity expressed in communism that Marx recognized in the modern history of capital is not assimilable without remainder to pre- or non-Marxian socialism. Marx's thought and politics are not continuous with the Spartacus slave revolt against Rome or the teachings of the apostles or with the radical egalitarianism of the Protestants or the Jacobins. So what was Marx's distinct contribution? As Marx put it, quote, Communism is the necessary form and the dynamic principle of the immediate future, but communism as such is not the goal of human development or the form of human society, close quote. This was because, according to Marx, quote again, communism is a dogmatic abstraction and only a particular manifestation of the humanistic principle and is infected by its opposite, private property, close quote. Marx was not the preeminent communist of his time, but rather its critic, seeking to push it further. The best Marxists who followed, such as Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, and Trotsky, who I quoted earlier, similarly sought to push their respective political movement of revolutionary social democracy in the Second International Period, the 1871 to 1917 period, further. In so doing, they revealed and grappled with the form of capital of their moment in history, what they called imperialism, seeking to make it into capital's highest and last stage, that is, the eve of revolution. <coughs> Badu, by, contra by contrast, addresses inequality as a timeless perennial problem of human existence. He thus departs fundamentally from Marx and Marxism and liquidates the revolution of capital. Badu conceives of the relation between freedom and equality as an ontological one, in the mathematical terms of set theory, trans-historicizing trans it, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later. Badu's background is in Lacanian and Althusserian post-structuralist French thought, in common with other prominent New Left thinkers and former students of Althusser, such as Etienne Balibar and Jacques Rancière. Althusser found in the Russian and Chinese revolutions a salutary challenge to the notion of a Hegelian logic of history, that revolutionary change could and indeed did happen as a matter of contingency. Althusser took great aspiration from Mao in China and Lenin in Russia for advancing the possibility of emancipation against a passive expectancy of automatic evolution in the historical process of capital. For Badu, this means that emancipation must be conceived of as an event, which involves a fundamental reconsideration of ontology. Badu does not conceive of the transformation of the capitalist mode of production that would allow for overcoming the socially pernicious aspects of specifically capitalist forms of inequality. By contrast, Marx looked forward to the potential for overcoming the conditions of possibility for the reproduction of capitalist class dynamics in the mode of production itself, capital's overcoming of the need to accumulate the value of surplus labor time. Marx saw the historical potential to overcome the socially mediating aspect of labor, expressed for, for, for instance excuse me, in automated machine production. However, Marx also foresaw that, short of socialism, the drive to accumulate surplus value results in producing a surplus population, an industrial reserve army of potential workers who thus remain vulnerable to exploitation. A politics based only in the workers' democratic discontents can result not in the overcoming of the social need for labor, but rather in the capitalist demand for more labor, the demand to be put to work. Or as Max Horkheimer, the director of the Marxist Frankfurt Institute for Social Research put it, machines have, quote, made not work, but rather the workers superfluous. Marx anticipated this when he warned that realization of the socialist demand to abolish private property would merely make society as a whole into one giant capitalist dominating its members. Marx even went so far as to analogize this with socialist calls to abolish marriage as a bourgeois institution, which he said would result only in universal prostitution, indeed that capitalism was already bringing this about. 
For Marx, elimination of a separate capitalist class would not in itself be emancipatory unless a transformation in what he called the mode of production and its social relations came about. Marx did not think that the capitalists were the cause, but rather the effect of capital, calling them its character masks. Nonetheless, Marx endorsed, however critically, the traditional socialist demand to abolish private property and to expropriate the expropriators, regarding this as a necessary first step. Necessary but not sufficient to realize a society beyond the mode of production and social relations of capital. As Lenin later underscored this in his pamphlet, The State and Revolution, on the eve of the October 1917 revolution in Russia, such social relations of bourgeois society, namely the mutual exchange of labor as the form of social solidarity and capital, could only be transformed gradually and thus wither away, and not be abolished and replaced at one stroke. The proletarian socialist revolution was supposed to open the door to this transformation. But since then, the history of the Russian and Chinese revolution showed another potential. That is, the reconstitution of capital under the guise of socialism. Marx had already foreseen such a possibility in the limited consciousness of his socialist and communist contemporaries of the 19th century, and he criticized them ruthlessly for this. Marx and Lenin recognized a problem in socialism itself that their supposed followers had neglected or avoided. All of this remains hidden to that due. But it was precisely this Marxist approach to capital as a mode of production or form of society that distinguishes Marx from other socialists or communists and motivated the revolutionaries who followed Marx, such as Lenin, maintaining that Marxism pursued the possibility of overcoming capital on the basis of capitalism itself. Badu situates emancipatory possibilities rather atavistically in prehistorical ontology to which the philosophy of mathematics for instance, the question of number and numbers, the title of one of his books, can be an adequate guide. For Badu, in a procedure that recalls a self-criticism session or an assembly at a re-education camp, matter itself, in its open-ended recombinations, poses the solution to what Marx called communism or the riddle of history. Each element must be broken down to its radical potential potentiality for permutation. For instance, in the Maoist revolutionary people, for emancipatory change to take place. It is not for nothing that Badu conceives of revolution not as a process but an event, or that his conception of process is founded on a conception of the event, and this is something that I'm going to get into a little bit more later. On the other hand, Badu finds Marxists such as Lenin and Marx himself conceding to the existing social hierarchies and thus betraying the idea of communism. For instance, in the party state, which Badu now regards in retrospect as a failed experiment. Thus, Badu. What of Marx and Marxism? Marx distinguished capitalist inequality from that of the traditional caste system that had characterized civilization for millennia before the emergence of bourgeois society in the post-Renaissance world. As Adorno, for one, pointed out, to call all of history, as Marx did, the history of class struggles, was to indict all of recorded history and thus to consign it to the mere prehistory of authentic humanity. But this humanity was itself historically specific and emergent to the era of capital. Just as traditional inequality was not the cause of the form of community that the ancients rega regarded as being divine in origin, capitalist inequality was not the cause but the effect, the product of the cosmos of capital. Marx's mag magnum opus, Capital explored how the post-industrial revolution society of capital produced a new form of inequality between capitalist and worker, but one that was liable to be cast and responded to in the form of the original revolt of the third estate that had ushered in modern bourgeois society in the 17th and 18th century. Marx found an important disparity, a self-contradiction to have developed between the political aspirations of the subjects of capital, their aspiration for social democracy, and the potential of capital to go beyond bourgeois society and its forms of politics, liberalism, and democracy. This did not make Marx or those who followed him illiberal or anti-democratic, but they did regard liberalism and democracy, the combined libertarian and social egalitarian impulses in modern politics, as a means and not as ends in and of themselves. This is because they regarded capitalism itself as a process and not merely a state of being. Marx and his best followers, such as Lenin, looked forward 
not merely to more liberalism and more democracy, but to the potential transcendence of the need for both liberalism and democracy, an end to politics as presently practiced. But not all at once, and not by denying them in the present. Capital is not, according to Marx, an eternal event of inequality that needs, as with Badu, to be met with the event of revolution. Badu does not deny liberalism and democracy, but rather unconsciously reaffirms their present bourgeois forms at a deeper level. Badu's ontology of radical egalitarian democracy provides not a critical recognition, but rather a philosophical affirmation of the way bourgeois society already proceeds, however contradictorily. Badu thus mystifies. The challenge is to recognize the symptomatic character of liberalism and democracy in the crisis of capital, as it developed in the 19th century setting the stage for the history that came later. But such symptomology was not to be cured in the sense of being eliminated, but rather undergone and worked through. As Nietzsche put it, modernity is an illness, but the way pregnancy is an illness, bringing forth new life. The problem, as Marx recognized it, was that by the mid-19th century, when bourgeois society entered into its crisis after the Industrial Revolution and became proletarianized, Humanity faced a situation in which, as Engels later described it, the capitalists were no longer and the workers not yet able to master the society of capital. Marx regarded this as the source of the authoritarianism of the modern capitalist nation state, despite the promises of classical bourgeois liberalism for a minimal state and a free cosmopolitan civil society that, for instance, would reduce legislatures to, at most, sites of public debate, and political recognition of social facts already accomplished on the ground. This is what Kant, for one, had expected. But the bourgeoisie could no longer, and the proletariat not yet, rule modern society. The genie of capital had been let loose. The historical task of emancipating humanity had thus fallen from the bourgeois to the proletarian members of society. Marxists have recognized that this is the situation in which the world has remained stuck ever since then ever since the failed social democratic revolutions of 1848, on the eve of which Marx and Engels had published their inaugural manifesto. For Marx, the demand for social democracy was part of the history of capital, to be worked through imminently and transcended. But none of this registers for Badu. Marx marked a potential turning point for humanity. He was not merely one in a chain of prophets reading, reaching back for thousands of years. He was a thinker and political actor for our modern time. <coughs> this is Pache Badu, who, for instance, sees a, a role model for communism in St. Paul. The cost of liquidating the specific history of capital, its peculiar constraint on society and its potential beyond itself, is Badu's reduction of communism to the perennial complaint of the subaltern, the millennial dream of social equality, as a specter haunting the world that has more in common with eschatological justice posed by religion at the end of time than with the pathology of the modern bourgeois world of capital in which humanity actually suffers today. We must awaken from this nightmare the vain wish that things be otherwise of the oppressed. For we are not only oppressed, but rather tasked by capital. Nevertheless, the failure of historical Marxism has made Badu an evidently adequate symptomatic expression of our time, its confusion and diminished expectations, well shy of the epochal transformation that had motivated Marx and the best Marxists historically. We must remember Marxism so we can forget Badu, forget the time that made such ideology, such naturalization, indeed ontologization of defeat, so appealing, and finally consign it where it belongs to prehistory. All right, so that's my polemic against Bedou. <laughs> um, let me just, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for more discussion. I'm just going to lay out some sort of uh, issues um, with respect to uh, Bedou's politics in the present. So Bedou uh, is currently, you know, not only doing the lecture circuit and publishing books, writing and publishing books. But he's also still politically active um, in France, uh, especially. But he's also active um, in China uh, in establishing a institute for the memory and the sort of history, the historical heritage of the uh, Cultural Revolution in China. It's a sort of joint French-Chinese effort. 
um, that he's involved in. Um, but in France, for instance, he uh, works on immigration issues. So he's an advocate of, of the people who are called without papers, right? So he's an advocate of the without papers movement. Um, and uh, around the time that he published um, The Communist Hypothesis, he also published a book on Sarkozy, the meaning of Sarkozy, uh, the sort of uh, analysis and condemnation of um, the current French uh, presidency, the conservative uh, president. Uh, Sarkozy. Um, so he's very active, and one of the readings that I had uh, recommended uh, for background for this uh, talk today uh, was on the uprising in Egypt. Right? Um, it's on <coughs> the website that he sort of uh, co-runs, <coughs> lacan.com. And right, so Tunisia and Egypt, the universal reach of popular uprisings, in which, again, this category of the event uh, is crucial for his understanding of, of the current uh, wave of, of uprisings in the Middle East and the Arab world. Um, so I wanted to sort of get into a discussion of where Badu's notion of the event comes from and how that sort of fits into um, the history of a certain kind of post-structuralist thought, in other words, the background that Badu has with Lacan and Althusser, um, and also the sort of deeper background with respect to um, uh, Lacan, who's the sort of, in a sense, the source in the background. So um, the figures that I'm mentioning, so Lacan is a, um, so the first generation sort of post-Freudian psychoanalyst, he considers himself a radical Freudian, French. Um, and Althusser uh, was a French communist who was deeply influenced by Lacan, and um, who, starting in the late 50s, um, became a kind of dissident communist in the French Communist Party. He became um, an advocate uh, but sort of quietly, not overtly, an advocate of, of Mao and the sort of Maoist approach to communism in the midst of the Soviet-Chinese uh, split that started in 1956 but really developed in the 60s. Um, as a dissident member of the Communist Party, Althusser um, was sort of muzzled by the Communist Party. In other words, they kind of restricted him to doing certain things and they restricted publications of his work and etc. because they considered him to be a kind of a revisionist or a renegade. Um, the French Communist Party was on the side of the Soviet Union um, against China and the Sino-Soviet split. Um, so uh, I wanted to sort of make mention then, there's, a, there's actually an article that I would recommend. Um, let me get the publication information for it. In Historical Materialism um, from 2004 on Althusser, that this kind of makes for some interesting reading. Um, the bibliographic information of so it's um, by a guy named um, Wal Suchting, and it's called Althusser's Late Thinking About Materialism. And it's in the journal Historical Materialism, which is a British journal, um, issue 12.1, and it's from 2004, um, a few years ago. And he talks about um, Althusser's turn in his late years, um, the late 70s and 80s, uh, in which um, Althusser started writing and publishing um, what Althusser himself called the sort of secret background for his approach to thinking about philosophy and Marxism. And the secret background was um, with respect to uh, Lacan's investigation of pre-Socratic philosophy. 
right, the pre-Socratic philosophers. Um, and specifically, there's a notion of materialism that, that Althusser had um, that's very influential and sort of finds its reiteration in Badu's work uh, later. And this is this sort of notion going back to Heraclitus and Parmenides and, and various other um, Epicurus and Democritus, um, ancient philosophers from, from classical antiquity, from classical Greece, um, on the question of uh, the nature of the world. And so I wanted to, uh, another short bit that I wanted to sort of do with you guys. Oh, this. About the kind of philosophical questions um, that sort of exercised Lacan and Althusser with respect to Freud. I wanted to sort of bring up the Freudian psychoanalytical background and the discussion of this kind of post-structuralist Marxism of Althusser, its background in Lacanian psychoanalysis, and the way in which Lacan sort of took off from and, and also departed from Freud. So I wanted to sort of lay that out a little bit. Um, and just to give a little bit of background with Freud, uh, which we can get into, we can go in different directions here, but I want to sort of talk about um, the difference between Freud and Lacan to start off. The question that arises from Freud's theory of the unconscious mental process is how can we know it? If the definition of the unconscious, according to Freud, his most important discovery, is that it comprises those thoughts that we do not consciously think, but nevertheless do think, and those feelings we don't consciously feel, and those memories we don't consciously remember, and that this is the vast majority of our mental life, unknown to our conscious minds, then what does this mean for us? According to Freud, it means that we must attend to its effects, even if we can never really know the cause in reality. This is why Freud thought that the best that could be achieved is a modicum of consciousness and a modicum of freedom, relative to the effects of the ineradicably preponderant unconscious character of our mental lives. For Freud, this was primarily a matter of our capacity to experience the new and the different. In other words, what uh, neurotics were were those who were incapable of experiencing the new and the different. Could we do so? Could we experience the new and the different without unconsciously repressing it into the pre-existing pattern of our prior life experience? This is the big question for Freud. Were we barred from the consciousness of change? Or was it we experience everything inevitably as a repetition? Freud didn't think so. And in fact, built his, clinic, built his clinical psychotherapeutic practice on the observation of change in mental life that was possible by the however marginal achievement of consciousness about our otherwise largely unconscious lives. We can't cease to be neurotic, according to Freud, because we can't eliminate the past and its effects over us, which constitute who we are, but nevertheless we can be less pathologically so. The classical philosophical question is that of the logic of being. Can we understand what we are, and if so, how can we do so? A different question, however, would be not knowing how we are, but how can we know our ability to change? Lacan famously described the unconscious, he has a description of the Freudian the unconscious, as being structured like a language. But it was a language that we could never understand. In other words, it was like a language, but not in and of itself a language. Rather, the unconscious mental process was, for Lacan, connected to the logic of being. Freud, however, did not analogize the unconscious with language, but rather with a biological organ. In other words, the unconscious functioned like an organ, not like a logic. But Freud's concern was not to understand the functioning of the organ in itself, but rather to seek to mitigate and alter its effects. This was why and how Freud analogized his approach to psychoanalytic therapy to medical science. Indeed, why he thought psychoanalysis was a legitimate part of biological science and not fundamentally different from, let alone opposed to it. The difference in analogies between Freud and Lacan is important because it speaks to their different concerns. Whereas Lacan was interested in the impossibility of understanding the logic of being, Freud was concerned not with understanding, but rather practical change. 
in this sense, the matter of concern is not how the unconscious is structured in itself, but rather with observable change in its effects. Freud's approach to psychoanalysis as a form of medicine was like a physical science. Lacan's approach was rather akin to a philosophy of mind, which Freud was not. For instance, in biomedical science, understanding exactly how a pharmaceutical, for example, or other therapeutic technique works in and of itself is less important than observing that it does indeed work. That a therapy works is more important than understanding how and why it does, because the purpose is to alleviate symptoms and mitigate causes for illness. The concern is first and foremost to not misattribute causes, in other words, to figure out what the therapy is working so that therapies can be selected with proper reason, practically. Medicine is eminently practical and hence not really philosophical in its concerns. It is not about understanding, but rather action. The question of how and why are subordinate and tend to be treated as fundamentally revisable, as disposable models of understanding rather than as truths in and of themselves. Lacan's approach to the psychoanalytical understanding of the unconscious, on the other hand, gave rise to some philosophical problems that inform the work of many who regard his approach as a way of getting at the problem of the logical being. Lacan, along with his Epigenes, is interested in the philosophical question of truth. But the question of truth is a traditional and not a modern philosophical problem. In asking the question of truth, little cognizance, if any, is taken of the Kantian revolution in modern philosophy that started in the late 19th century in which philosophy stopped making traditional ontological claims. Rather, the emphasis was on freedom. Starting with Kant, the emphasis was on freedom, specifically transformation, and not being. In other words, for example, the philosophical question of how we can conceive of change, or in this way of understanding, of our own being in time, takes uh, precedence. This was, however, in keeping with Lacan himself, who was deeply influenced by the work of the philosopher Martin Heidegger, most of all in his famous work, Being in Time. Heidegger said that the problem is that Western thought had lost the ability to think the being of beings. And thus, Heidegger returned to the pre-Socratic thinkers. Lacan's follower, Althusser, also returned to the pre-Socratics, especially in his late works. This is the root of Lacan's influence on the French communist Althusser and of his students, one of whom, Badu, has reconceived of communism, elaborating from the Lacanian Althusserian approach to understanding change in being. Right? In other words, this is the sort of background, the essential background for, for Badu. Um, so that difference uh, between a kind of practical mode of inquiry that you get in Freudian psychoanalysis and the Lacanian turn to what I'm calling a philosophy of mind, in other words, turning psychoanalysis into a philosophy of mind, is really central because it, it shifts the entire register back into what I'm calling traditional philosophical concerns. Traditional, not modern, philosophical concerns. In other words, Lacan, Althusser, Badu uh, re-engage a kind of traditional philosophical question of the truth of being. How do we understand the truth of being? Can, can we understand the truth of being? It asks those kinds of questions. Um, uh, there's a, a writer um, who wrote, I think it's in Critique. This is the Peter Osborne piece that you sent me, Lucy. Um, uh, a, a criticism of Badu uh, following from Adorno in which he called um, Badu neoclassical. Right. Another way of describing Badu in the sense is as scholastic. In other words, that is sort of re-raising re questions from um, perhaps medieval philosophy from a kind of scholasticism um, uh, and that I find kind of a good way of classifying this as neoclassical philosophy or scholastic philosophy or just straightforwardly traditional philosophy. Um, so the question is, why would that make a difference? In other words, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the polemic that I gave earlier, um, in which I was talking about the difference between Marxism and Badu's notion of communism. Um, specifically, so this is with regard to how um, Badu thinks of communism as 
a perennial countercurrent to the history of civilization, like going back to classical antiquity, going, in a sense, all the way back, um, more than 10,000 years, ever since the establishment of the state. Right? The idea is that ever since the state was established, there's been a countercurrent. And it's this radical idea of equality against the hierarchy of civilization that um, Badu is interested in. Um, and for Badu, this has to do with what he calls the sort of radical ontology of matter. Um, so I wanted to sort of cite something that um, this, uh, this essay, <coughs> while um, Septing's essay is, switch thing. Um, which is going back to uh, I'll read part of this. Uh, right, this is about um, the question of being and the logic of being. In other words, why is there something and not nothing? That kind of a question. Like, you know, why do we exist? Literally, this is how it's posed. Um, and it's posed uh, specifically uh, by Althusser um, in, this, in this way. Um, and this is, uh, in, in this essay that I'm reading from, this is described as, uh, by Althusser as aleatory materialism. Like aleatory materialism. Why is there something and not nothing? Um, right, so Althusser wrote, that Epicurus says that before the formation of the world, an infinity of atoms were falling parallel to each other in the void. They are still falling. This implies that before the formation of the world, there was no meaning, neither cause nor end, nor reason nor unreason. Right? So thus before the formation of the world, there exist two basic items, atoms and the void. And they fall parallel to each other. They have nothing to do with each other. They, they just, that's the sort of original kind of ontological condition. Um, then something happens, right? And this is the, the concept that Althusser has of um, swerve or the klinemen, right? <sighs> So the atoms are falling in the void, parallel to each other, and then for some reason, unknowable, they swerve, right? They swerve and they interact with each other. Um, and in so doing, right, in, in the swerve, in that kind of primordial interaction of the atoms falling infinitely through the void parallel to each other, they create conditions of possibility or worlds. In other words, this is how the world comes into existence. That as soon as one atom swerves and interacts with another atom, you have the coming forth of a world. Right? And this is, this is where Badu gets his idea of the logics of worlds. I like get to pay attention to that title. The logics, plural, of worlds, plural. Because the idea is that there is no world, rather there is a kind of um, infinity of matter that is constantly generating and, and, and repositing and destroying the world. Right? So worlds are constantly coming into being and uh, being destroyed. Right? And this is the sort of pre-Socratic pre pre understanding of, of matter. Um, uh, right. An infinitesimal swerve, no one knows where or when or how it takes place, or what causes an atom to swerve from its vertical fall in the void, and breaking the parallelism in an almost negligible way at one point, induce an encounter, right? So the swerve induces an encounter with the atom next to it. And from this encounter, from encounter to encounter, a pileup and the birth of a world, that is an aggregation of atoms induced in a chain reaction by the initial swerve and encounter. Thus, the origin of every world, and therefore of all reality and all meaning, is due to the swerve. Um, in order to, for the swerve to give rise to an encounter out of which a world is born, that encounter must be a lasting encounter. 
which then becomes the basis for all reality, all necessity, all meaning, and all reason. But the encounter can also not last, and then there is no world. The world may be called an accomplished fact. This accomplishment of the fact is just a pure effect of contingency, since it depends on the aleatory encounter of the atoms due to the swerve of the clinamon. Once the fact has been accomplished, there is established the reign of reason, meaning, necessity, and end. So this is, this is Althusser uh, writing in the, I think in the 80s, yes. Um, right. So this has a bearing on the notion of change. Right. In other words, change happens because the swerve, what the swerve gives rise to is an event. Right, and this is how change takes place. Right. Um, this is the sort of philosophical underpinning of, of this idea. Um, now, what's interesting then is that uh, this is where I might. We bring up some Lacan to sort of uh, fill in some of this idea. You have these um, Venn diagrams. Um, one which is sort of an elaboration of the other, but let's start with a simple one for a second. Um, right, the idea with Lacan is that consciousness, the subject, right, is a symptom. Right, this is that's that much is Freudian, right. and the subject is the product of the interaction of different orders, right. The order of the symbolic, the order of the real, the order of the imaginary. So our consciousness, our subjectivity, is this coincidence of these orders, right? And the these orders' interaction with each other is variable; it's constantly changing, um, but it gives rise to this sort of subject. Um, this is a little bit of an elaboration of that same diagram. Right, so the imaginary order um, is, you know, for instance, the order of the body. This would be a sort of empirical kind of the way you perceive the world out of your body. Right, that's what um, Lacan is calling the imaginary order. Then culture is a kind of symbolic order, right, that gives you signifiers. Right, and so the interaction of the imaginary and the symbolic order, or of the body and the signifier gives meaning, right? Um, and then, of course, there's reality. There's the real order, um, which uh, Lacan uh, describes also as the realm of fantasy. Right? And the subject is the interaction of these three, right? The interaction of the imaginary order, the symbolic order, the real order, or the interaction of the body, signifiers, culture, and fantasy. One difference that I want to mention straight away, then, um, and its relation to what I was just talking about, the swerve and the event of the encounter, is that the conscious subject is, if you will, an illusion. Right? That's, that's basically what's going on here. What's going on is that it's an illusion spun of the interaction of these three different orders. Right? That's why it's this other image is the same. Um, and in that respect, right, what I was reading from earlier about the swerve, the original sort of atomic quality of the universe, and it giving rise to new worlds of existence, right, is that you cannot know how, when, or why, right, this takes place. However, you 
might think that you do, right? So the question is, why do we think that we do? Well, precisely as a function of, of this kind of operation of consciousness, according to Lacan. Right, so the idea is that, um, in a sense, our own consciousness of the world is a constant break on, it's a constant obstacle to um, openness to the encounter of the event. In other words, this is where you get the Althusserian notion of ideology. If any of you have read anything you know, like ideological state apparatuses and this kind of thing, right? Like that kind of notion of ideology. What ideology is, and what Badu is mostly concerned with, um, coming off of Lacan and also, you know, the sort of reopening of traditional questions of, of philosophy, is um, what they call the metaphysics of closure. Right? In other words, the problem then, as they see it, is that our consciousness always seeks to close down possibilities. Right, that we're constantly, in a sense, ideologically in our consciousness, and in the, in the illusion of our own subjectivity, what we're doing is foreclosing possibilities for change. Right, in other words, we close ourselves off to the event, the encounter. Right. But it nevertheless happens. Right, in other words, the idea is that um, these events are inevitable. Right, and so... Um, they constantly challenge our consciousness, they constantly rupture our ideological conception of ourselves, our subjectivity, and we're either open to that or we're not. In other words, we're either closed to that or we're open to it. And this is the conception of communism that they have running through this, Althusser and Badu. In other words, the challenge of communism is to render humans open to the radical, and in their sort of atomic sense of kind of ontology, um, and th their sort of notion of materialism, to be open to the radical possibilities of change in the world that we otherwise foreclose symptomatically through our consciousness. Right. That um, in that respect, uh, you know, the whole question of communism goes back to uh, the question of being that the pre-Socratic philosophers asked of themselves. In other words, why is there something and not nothing? Right? How does something come into existence? Right? How does the new come into existence in that respect? And um, communism is the openness to the radical egalitarianism of the permutation of matter that's revealed in the event. It's because matter itself has a sort of uh, what, what Badu calls a radical anarchic equality. It has the character of radical anarchic equality. And so, um, you, know, you might see, therefore, um, even if I can be allowed to be a little bit tendentious about this, um, that there is a sort of, um, you know, uh, ascetic or stoical quality to this approach to the question of, of the universe, ontological being, change, Communism. In other words, what communists are, like the pre-Socratic philosophers, are those who have accepted the kind of reality right, and are open to um, this kind of radical um, permutability of, of matter itself. Right? And this is essentially, um, you know, what human beings do. Symbolically, they sort of raise um, ideologies in, uh, in society, in civilization, and that those are constantly kind of subject to um, events, right? And so, basically, in this view, if you look back over the course of human history, you'll find that civilization is characterized by all sorts of hierarchies and social orders being developed, but they're constantly being disrupted by events of, of kind of revolution, right? And for, for Badu, after Althusser and Lacan, this is because, um, you know, the sort of radical, anarchic, egalitarianism of matter itself is bursting forth constantly. Right? And that the point of communism is to be true to the event. That's how Badu defines it, in other words, the 
to, be, to have fidelity to the idea of communism is to be true to the event, to not allow yourself to ideologically and metaphysically foreclose yourself to the event. All right, so of course he loved the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt. Why? Because he saw that, oh, this shows that all of this talk about how the Arab world is um, conservative and parochial and, and et cetera, and undemocratic, right? Um, proved that it wasn't the case, proved that the whole ideology of, of the Arab world and Islam that the West had sort of foisted upon things was false, right? And that the task was to be true to the event. Right? In other words, what was great about these uprisings was their eventual character. That the task of communists was to, was to resist the sort of ideological foreclosure on such events, right? to show that this can happen. Um, now, what I was polemicizing earlier uh, about is um, I would like to situate this kind of, this whole discussion that I've given about the kind of philosophical, if you will, underpinnings of Badu and the background in Lacan and Althusser and what I was calling the traditional philosophical view um, situated itself as a historical symptom. In other words, say, okay, why do things look this way? In other words, why would someone named Alain Badu, who came of age in the 60s and became a Maoist and you know, was a kind of radical, political radical, and is now still sort of carrying on and you know, spinning out these, these massive tomes, like being an event and the logics of worlds and thinking that Events in the world, like what happened in Tunisia and Egypt, and then presumably Libya, prove his philosophy. Right? In other words, why, does he, why, does, why would he think this? And why would he find a hearing for this? In other words, why is you know, Badu a major thinker on the international left now? And what I would offer is um, a kind of interpretation um, as follows. Um, First of all, first of all, right, the kind of view that, um, that Badu has in mind going back to right, the birth of civilization, first of all, I would say this is a projection backwards. In other words, I don't think actually that the tribal mystics in ancient Greece, because that's what they were, these people are the curious. Um, we're really asking the same questions that Lacan, Althusser, and Badu are asking, or Heidegger. Like, I don't, I don't really think that they were asking the same questions. However, we can read them and sort of attribute meaning to their kind of, you know, meditations on the nature of matter, and we can find resonances in our own time. Right? So the first thing is that it's a projection back. Right? But a projection back of what and from what? Right? Now, Specifically, um, I brought up earlier in my, in my first talk the, the polemic against Badu, um, that Badu in maintaining fidelity to the event is actually maintaining fidelity to um, what I'm calling in sort of traditional Marxist terms the people of democratic revolution. In other words, if we kind of go out of the pre-Socratic realm and the history of civilization per se, and we bring it more into the modern era, right, if we're talking about um, sort of post-Renaissance world, if you will, right, so um, maybe from uh, the 15th, um, through the 19th and 20th centuries, So what we're talking about is a kind of radical um, mutability and changeability of society that has come into view um, the breakdown of traditional civilization. Uh, with its you know, traditional hierarchies, etc. that the emergence of modern society is really about the breakdown of traditional civilization 
and therefore the experience of radical change that, in a sense, um, humanity did not experience prior to the modern era. Right, so this is the And I want to say something about this with respect to um, you know what's meant because I'm not going to really get into a characterization, excuse me, of modern bourgeois society, but rather we could think about it in terms of how conservatives have regarded this. Right? Conservatives have regarded this <coughs> negatively. Right? In other words, if you went and talked to the Pope or other leaders in the Catholic Church, right, the emergence of you know. Capitalism, etc., in modern bourgeois society would be seen as a real threat to human and divine values. In other words, it's a sort of breakdown of traditional civilization. Um, it's the, the breakdown of, of traditional divine and traditional human values. And that this gives rise to apparently radical philosophical questions. Right, so there's a, there's a deeper background, if you will, um, in the early Enlightenment of the 17th century. You'll see a lot of reference um, in uh, Althusser, also Lacan, and to a certain degree in Badu, to Spinoza, for example. Right. And uh, there's a sort of radical philosophical Enlightenment that they'd see themselves as following specifically with regard to a kind of traditional uh, distinction between idealism and materialism. So in the traditional idealist and materialist distinction, right, Descartes is the bad guy, he's the idealist, or you see Cartesian dualism, <coughs> Spinoza is the good guy because he's um, a radically ontologically materialist kind of guy. And the, in the idealism versus materialism debate, if you will, um, which also can be projected back to the Socratic turn. In other words, Plato is sort of the original idealist philosopher and therefore um, problematic figure. Um, therefore, there's a, there's a way in which this view of idealism versus materialism seeks its roots in pre-Socratic philosophy in certain respects, like the um, Democritus, Epicurus, even Marx wrote a sort of dissertation on this stuff, question of idealism versus materialism. That the sort of traditional distinction versus um, idealism and materialism that you'll, you'll see that Badu himself um, engages quite a bit is the ontological primacy of matter. In other words, Badu considers himself a materialist philosopher. And so what this means is that matter is prior to consciousness, right? rather than consciousness being prior to matter, that kind of idea. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in the history of Marxism, there's a lot of uh, sort of scope for this kind of approach, um, including it can be derived even from Marx's and Engels' own writings, unfortunately. But this idea of the kind of, okay, what's ontologically, you know, the ontological primacy of matter, that kind of idea. What I mentioned earlier about Kant um, who's coming at the end of the Enlightenment, towards the end of the 18th century. Um, is that there's a way in which Kant stops asking these kinds of questions. In other words, does matter exist prior to consciousness, or does, does consciousness exist prior to matter? Um, rather, he sort of suspends that problem in favor of a kind of a Cartesian problem, actually, and this is why it's known as German idealism, which is that rather than saying does, in, does matter exist prior to consciousness or does consciousness exist prior to matter, rather the question is what can we know? In other words, not, not what is the truth of the world, but rather what can we know? Right? And so it, it sort of starts with Descartes' famous idea that the one thing that I 
can be free of doubt about is that I am myself thinking. Right, the cogito ergo sum. Um, and so Kant thinks rather um, that we can't know the world as a thing in itself, but rather we can know the world in the objects that we make of it. Right? In other words, we know objects of our practice and of our experience, not things in and of themselves, but rather objects. And in knowing objects, we actually don't really know the objects so much as we know ourselves as subjects. Right. And not just as thinking subjects in the sense of the ideas that we have about the world, but also as practical subjects. Right? That we know our practices, um, that we can reflect upon our thinking and our practices, um, and that's what we can know. Right? Um, and so there isn't this question of where did the world come from? Like these kinds of questions of, you know, there are atoms falling parallel in the void, and then the swerve happened, and the world came into being. Like it's just not, right? That basically the whole question of the origin of the world is sort of suspended, it's sort of put off. It, you know, it becomes a different kind of a question. Um, it, that ceases to be the sort of primary philosophical question. In favor of what can we know about our own subjectivity in terms of our consciousness, and our consciousness in terms of not only our categories of thought, but also our practices. Right? Because consciousness is understood as both theoretical and practical. And that's what we can know because we can reflect upon it. Now, um, what do I want to say about this? Uh, so this is, you know, in a sense what I'm arguing is that Marx, who emerges in the 19th century, does not come out of a long line of materialist philosophers going back to the pre-Socratics, like Epicurus, right, and through, you know, various Gnostical thinkers, and Spinoza, right, and uh, kind of maybe, maybe empiricism considered materialist, who knows? Um, and then, you know, coming to Marx. Um, but rather that Marx is coming out of this other tradition, this revolution in philosophy that happened um, with Kant at the end of the 18th century, in which traditional idealism and materialism was no longer posed as a kind of philosophical issue in the same way. Um, what that meant, therefore, was that the questions that one asked were not about the truth of the world, the truth of matter, but rather, how can we know and be free in our practices as subjects in society. Right? In other words, the question then becomes a kind of self-reflexive knowledge of our subjectivity as practical, as matters of our practice. Right? Matters of our practice and matters of how we understand our own practices, the self-understanding of practices. Um, and that that is situated as a matter of society. In other words, not posed at the level of atoms in the void swerving into each other, but rather how human beings interact with each other. Right, but that's, that's, and you can see that this is, for those of you who have some background in this, this is actually where uh, Marx is following after Hegel. In other words, Hegel has um, a sort of following through on Kant, and there are others in this trajectory like Fichte. Right, who you know, start talking about the conditions and possibility of our subjectivity as being about the existence of other subjects and the way we interact in our social practices. And so society comes into view in a very kind of robust way with Fichte and Hegel. Um, and then the question is, okay, what kind of society do we live in? In other words, what kind of subjects are we that we interact with each other in the way that we do, both theoretically and practically, and uh, this affects our conscious lives, and what can we do about it? In other words, do we, as social subjects, end up someplace where we can call, you know, call it a kind of pathological society? In other words, do we get stuck in a form of social practice 
that is problematic for us, and what can we do to change that? In other words, what's the possibility of changing that? Of transforming our subjectivity in terms of our practical consciousness, practical action, right? And that that's where the whole notion of, in a sense, socialism comes from. The idea is that socialism is the possibility of us consciously modi uh, modifying and improving our social practices, and there therefore emancipating ourselves. Right, which is quite different from the notion of the event. Right, the event is something that happens to us. Right, and we have to be open to it. Right, as I said, in a kind of ascetic, kind of stoical kind of manner. Right, um, that you know, to be good human beings or is to be you know, in touch with the ontological properties of matter and be open to the possibility of encountering the event. It's a different, fundamentally different way of thinking about things than you know, the sort of Marxist one. The Marxist one is concerned with the kinds of beings that we are, that we've come to be as a matter of history, and how can we change that if we find it to be pathological and problematic? Is there a possibility of us ourselves changing it rather than change happening to us and, other, and, and us being open to it or not? Michael. Um, I'll say there's like one problem with the way you're parsing things in that. Like with Badu, you know, you have you have these kind of sets of aggregated objects or aggregated signifiers which kind kind of constitute the subject as kind of as the passive end of it or as the passive receiving end of a certain amount of sets. So that means you're separating what, you know, in Hegelian terms you could term as the new as being an event and that which passed or that which you're operating in or whatever analytic differentiations you're making about objects, you know, as being exactly that, as analytic, as self-contained, as within the set, you know, like sets are material or materially oriented, as in you live in a specific place in the world, you have certain words that are used there, certain meanings. But certain you live in a world, that. in a world, right? So yeah, the concept absolutely, of, but, you yeah. know, there's obviously a certain amount of foreclosure between, you know, actual spaces, and, it, you know, the openness is toward these other, these other spaces, like what the material that you're being open to is a certain new. It's a, it's a it's um it's definitely more material materially oriented in that you know you can't have a certain set or aggregate of objects or concepts without having been in a certain place at a specific time, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I mean you know I think there you know he he but you himself will have you know, these kind of general truth functions that he says operate once we like name the unnameable or whatever. Um, and those truth functions are very similar to Hegelian uh, larger categories in that they're art or... Well, know, the way they're conceived is the difference. In other words, what Badu thinks is that um, this is where his sort of set theory comes in. Like, so he's a mathematician, he's a philosopher of mathematics, Badu. I didn't mention that, because I'm kind of focused on its political aspects. But as a philosopher of mathematics, um, he's interested in set theory as a way of um, explicating um, the infinity of possibility from um, a kind of finite world of concrete instances, right? Whether it's understood as atoms or understood as sort of worlds, right? How can, a fi how can finite matter give rise to infinite possibilities? And he thinks that set theory expresses that, right? Because it's about sort of, you know, infinite number of recombinative sets from a finite number of objects, right? That's the idea of set theory. Um, what I'm saying is that, right, that notion of, um, you know, the event as the event of the new, in other words, a recombination, right, of kind of um, resetting, if you will, of the world, um, is actually quite different from um, the kind of idea of self transformation as comes out of the uh, German idealist philosophy, Kant, Hegel, that Marx is taking off from. Um, and also that, you know, in a sense, uh, Maybe another way of kind of complicating matters would be um, that Badu has a hard time describing the specific possibilities that come out of this history, right, as opposed to uh, you know his notion of sort of sets and change um, 
don't really admit much of history. They basically, you know, they can happen, right? But there isn't much of an explanation of why, right? There might be an explanation of how, um, and there might even be an explanation of what. In other words, I'm not denying a certain kind of descriptive power that Badu has for thinking about sort of radical politics, but I am saying that there is a kind of an absence of a why, right? Because the why is seen as ontological. In other words, the, the why is sort of permanent. Oh, just one comment, and then I want to make an announcement. Um, but I can get wrap up. But uh, well, it just seems like the significant difference can, wouldn't even need to be discussed in the realm of how Badu versus what you're saying attempts to understand the world. The question could be even, even if Badu's ontology is quote unquote true, that atoms began falling and contingently, like mixed with a void if change happens to us as an event contingently, even if that were true, the difference would be in asking the question, are we content with that as, as, as the reality? Are we content with change happening as a matter of contingency? Or are we interested in the possibility of um, conscious transformation, even if that seems well, all I mean, all I meant in bringing up kind of like the analytic aspect is that you know the way that I would assume that we conceive history is as an analytic practice, as like a recapitulation of already crude materials, already known objects into you know whatever new situ whatever new situation. What happens with the subject in in the event is that there is no name for the, for whatever you know matter is appearing, and that we have to also be open to that naming. And I think there's a certain there's a certain paranoia, obviously, about you know kind of like the left foreclosing on its own and blocking off possibilities for its own. And I think that you know in some ways that kind of addresses that. You know. Right. What Badu is concerned with is why, um, in a sense, he's concerned with why emancipation fails. Right, why events become foreclosed, um, you know, what happens in that instance. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a problem. What I'm saying is that um, he sort of hypostasizes that problem, like he turns that into kind of a perennial problem, um, that this is what we do. And this, I'm tracing that back to Lacan, right, to the Lacanian idea of the trap of consciousness. In other words, that there's a kind of a trap to our self conception of ourselves. Um, that necessarily forecloses us to possibilities, right? Now, um, right, and again, it's, it's a matter of an attitude, right? Um, and for Badu then to have the proper attitude, right, is to, in a sense, realize that, you know, we are given to foreclose possibilities in this way, um, which is different from, you know, different from pursuing possibilities for change and transformation. It's, it's fundamentally different from that. Um, that. And again, it's because the, the matter is being posed as a philosophical question, right? In other words, um, how can we op be open to the truth of being? That's basically the question. You know, it's the sort of pre-Socratic question. And what I'm saying is that some, some other stakes are there and that the, you know, the passing of those stakes or would give rise to this kind of postmodern communism that Badu is interested in. In other words, you know, I didn't sort of say this earlier, but I kind of kept the question of postmodernism at bay. Um, but specifically, you know, Badu is given a kind of version of communism that's quite appropriate to a kind of post postmodern kind of moment in which we're skeptical of the subject. You know, we're skeptical of conscious attempts to change the world. We're skeptical of Hegelian accounts of history. And there's obviously a deeper background there with Althusser. In other words, Althusser is a sort of preeminent anti-Hegelian Marxist. That was a sort of thing. And that the basis of that would have been a kind of Lacanian skepticism about consciousness. Right? In other words, the sort of preeminent category in Hegel is consciousness. And so once you kind of introduce skepticism about that, or call it ideology, then a certain kind of um, characterization of the world follows. Right? And the characterization of the world is that the problem with the world is that we're not open to the encounter of the event. Right? That's, in a sense, the political problem. The political problem is that you have these social institutions and ideologies that, that foreclose us to the constant bringing forth of new worlds 
through these events, like the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt. But that's the sort of conception of politics. Um, but there is a sort of alternative, that's my point. The alternative would be um, that there is a self-reflexivity available in existing practices, in other words, that we're not just in our practices and in our consciousness foreclosing the world, but we're in fact bringing forth possibilities, right? That those sort of what would be called kind of metaphysical categories, right, from this kind of materialist perspective that Badu thinks that he's in, um, this is a kind of anti-metaphysical materialism, or you know, but obviously it's a kind of radical metaphysical materialism. This whole notion, right, of the atoms in the void, and the event, like these are all extremely metaphysical categories. But he thinks of them as being non-metaphysical, specifically because um, they don't hypostasize categories of consciousness and categories of practice. Right. In other words, it's a sort of metaphysics of the event versus a metaphysics of practice that kind of idea. Um, and what I'm saying is that, you know, this is being sort of miscast in a way, that this is the sort of postmodern um, sort of condition of that do, is specifically to sort of pose the question as, you know, can we know the truth of the world or are we always sort of subject to illusions about that? Right? And so the speculative content of that truth, it's not that, you know, Epicurus, it's not like that in this view Epicurus knows the truth of the world, but rather know something about the truth of the appearance of the world that then can allow them to be open to the possibility of other things. Yeah, there's actually a phrase I meant to highlight it, but then I lost it about like that, about how things are radically materialist. Like things, like this is like the Althusser notion. Like things are radically materialist, and right, and so the idea is that you have to be open to the radical challenge of things. I know people have to leave in class. Oh, no, we have a class. We have a. Okay. Okay. Clubhouse has a coffee break tomorrow at Cafe Bacchia at 4:30. They talked about contingency, freedom, post-structuralism, etc. Come to our convention on uh, April 29th. We're going to have a panel on political philosophy and a panel on art, and we'll also probably be doing a, a lead-up event, which is going to be a panel.